That's always so loud. I want to welcome everyone to our lunchtime lecture series at the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability. This is our Justice Agendas for Confronting Environmental Crisis lecture series, and it is a curricular and co-curricular conversation sponsored by our environmental justice field of specialization and certificate program. I have dropped a link to the certificate program <clears throat> in the chat. You can also find it on the event page on our website um, or simply Google Environmental Justice Certificate at the UMC's school. We do have an upcoming deadline for applications, which is April 30th. So if you're interested in as a student um, at the University of Michigan in any program or department, feel free to apply and consider joining us for the 12 credit certificate in environmental justice that we do offer in addition to our master's degree programs. My name is Rebecca Harden and I'm a faculty member in that environmental justice program. I work myself <clears throat> primarily in equatorial Africa where land rights and access to land are long, have long been and are becoming a really important um, question uh, and one that is increasingly uh, complicated by claims and urbanization and other issues that our guest today has written a great deal about and is able to connect with some of the justice issues we are grappling with in our own backyard here in Michigan in the Detroit area and the wider state of Michigan and the Rust Belt. So I really look forward to our session today. Moderating our session today with me is graduate student Jess Yan who is actually an undergrad degree from the University of Michigan as well in sociology and ecology and evolutionary biology, a phenomenal systems thinker and a phenomenal member of our community who as a queer Chinese American has brought incredibly subtle understandings of the ways in which Detroit, Dearborn, the state of Michigan and the United States in this time is negotiating um, justice questions, equality questions, racialized um, abuses of systems that affect all of us. Research that Jess is currently conducting looks at food systems in the Detroit area and the intersections of philanthropic practice, volunteerism, and food in access inequalities in those matrices. And I look forward to hearing from Jess when Bernadette's talk concludes. Jess will kick off our questions and answers on behalf of our community of students and learners at the U of MCs. Jess will also be uh, delivering what we think of as a, um, and often talk about as a land acknowledgement, which is of course much more than just a land acknowledgement in these times, but it is a way that we think about the histories of our own university um, and the injustices that are sort of hardwired into it by history. These are often done at the beginning of a session like this, and I just want to say at the outset that we have been experimenting as a group with what happens when we place it more in the middle of what we do, when we think with the ideas of our scholars and our visiting speakers about the ways we acknowledge the harms that um, business as usual in our universities and places of work have perpetrated over years in a place like Michigan. So Jess will open us out with that and with some questions for Bernadette. But at the moment, I'm going to cede the mic to my friend and colleague, Damani Partridge, who's here with us today from his joint appointment in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies and the Department of Anthropology here at the University of Michigan. Damani is a generous colleague and a very visionary scholar who has done a lot of work um, based on field work in Germany and his first book about that work, Hypersexuality and Headscarves, Race, Sex, and Citizenship in the New Germany was published by Indiana University Press um, back in 2012. He's working on a new book now, which is about articulating blackness as a universal claim, Holocaust heritage, European enlightenment, and non-citizen futures. Damani is thinking and working with a range of populations from first generation immigrants to Germany, to the histories of black American deployments uh, in German history in Europe and the ways in which those colliding communities and you know cultures and symbols of difference have mattered and do matter to the navigation of rights and security and prosperity in contemporary Europe. Um, those reflections have much to do with a cosmopolitan community like Detroit and it's my pleasure to have Damani open some reflection on the linkages between his own work and that of his friend and colleague Bernadette Atuhini. Thanks to both of you for being here today. I'll let you speak to Mani. 
Thanks, uh, Rebecca, so much for inviting us. And thanks, uh, Bernadette, uh, for um, joining us and, and telling us about your work. Um, I know my students are really struck by your piece in Predatory Cities and have a number of questions. I don't know how many questions we're we'll going to be able to get to, but we look forward to hearing more from you about that project now. Um, just by means of introduction, uh, Bernadette Atuene is a um, current Open Society Fellow working on this project in Predatory Cities in Detroit. You might have seen her on in places like Democracy Now! and other uh, national international media. Her first book was called We Want What's Ours, Learning from South Africa Land Restitution Program. Um, and she's also, so as you can see, she's, she's traced this question of, of property around the world, I mean, from South Africa to here, thinking about dispossession and uh, of, of something that seems to be there forever, but it's actually not. Um, and she's helping us to see how and why not, and, and particularly for whom that's not the case. Um, so she's a graduate of Yale Law School, Harvard um, School, John F. Kennedy School of Government with a, a master in public administration and UCLA, where she wrote an undergraduate thesis. I just, I think this is a fun fact on called Soul, Soul Music, Music as a Means of Communicating Political Ideology. So you can see she's also a creative scholar um, who's thinking about the everyday um, in relationship to um, uh, policies and practices of social change. Um, she's also, also deeply engaged in Detroit and, and uh, activist networks to think not only about um, studying predatory cities, but also how to change them, um, how to make uh, people have access to things that they think was theirs um, and how to make that that generational wealth also apply to, to Black people um, and, and Black cities. Um, so I, I'll, I'll stop there because I don't want to take too much time away from her. But she's, she's also a professor now, I should say this, at uh, Chicago Kent um, as a, a law professor there and also a, a research professor at the American Bar Foundation in Chicago. Um, so thank you, Professor Atuane, uh, for joining us. And we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Damani, uh, who's one of my dear friends. Thank you for that very kind in introduction. If you want a good introduction, you got to have one of the homies do it. <laughs> this is my new conclusion. <laughs> All right, my talk today is called Predatory Cities. Um, I wrote a paper, and maybe, Rebecca, we can put a link to the paper in the chat so people have access to it. Um, I define predatory cities as urban areas where officials take property from residents and transfer it to public coffers intentionally or unintentionally violating existing laws. In the larger paper, I give lots of examples of predatory cities, uh, namely uh, Ferguson, Missouri, pointing to the unconstitutional uh, policing that led to fines and fees of uh, disproportionately levied against African Americans. And it wasn't individual police officers who benefited, it was the state fisc itself. It was the public purse of the city of Ferguson itself that benefited. I give the example of New Orleans where uh, the local New Orleans parish courts were violating a constitutional provision that says you can't lock people up for poverty. Right? These are not the Elizabethan days. A debtor's prisons have been outlawed, yet that's exactly what they were doing uh, until a district court intervened. And the fees and fines that they were collecting, they were sending people to jail for not paying fees and fines. And it was the court itself that was benefiting from these fees and fines. They were running the court with the fees and fines. Uh, and I give the example of uh, Pennsylvania uh, Philadelphia and, and Washington, D.C., where they violate civil forfeiture laws um, such that they take people's property without due process. And it's not, again, individual police officers who are benefiting, but it, it's the police budget itself. And so I identify a trend uh, of these local instances of local governments uh, taking property against the law and it not benefiting any one individual, but rather the public purse. So the instance of predatory cities that I want to kind of drill down and share with you today is not the one of New Orleans or DC or Philly um, or even Ferguson, but the one of Detroit right here in our own uh, backyard. So what's happening in Detroit? Well, in Detroit, since the Great Recession ended in 2009, one in three owners 
have had their homes confiscated by the local government. And I need to make sure everyone understands the difference between tax foreclosure and mortgage foreclosure. Mortgage foreclosure is when you fail to pay your mortgage and the bank takes your home. Tax foreclosure is much more invidious because it's we the people ourselves. It's the, it's the local government that is taking your home uh, for failure to pay property taxes. So when I say one in three, that really doesn't often register with people until I show visuals. And so activists on the ground, we're calling this a hurricane without water, right? Just because just like with Hurricane Katrina came and devastated um, the lower third of New Orleans, that's exactly what's happening today with tax foreclosure. Every red dot you see here is a home that has been confiscated for failure to pay their taxes, has been confiscated through the tax foreclosure process. And when I kind of go one level up, you can see, but then when I give you a view of the entire city of Detroit, you can see there is practically no place in Detroit that has been untouched by this property tax foreclosure crisis. This is the photo, this is the image of what it looks like when I say one in three homes has been taken through property tax foreclosure. So the question is what in the world is going on in Detroit? A large part of that, again, I give a more detailed nuanced explanation, but a big component of that is about predatory mortgage lending. So they are con connected, right? So we know all the empirical evidence tells us that in places where there was extensive uh, predatory mortgage lending, uh, which is mostly, happened in black and brown communities, you had a precipitous drop in housing values. So after the Great Recession, housing values dropped nationally. But we found a particularly precipitous drop in black and brown communities who were subjected to predatory lending. And as you can see, right after the Great Recession, property values in Detroit drop and they never recover. Um, and the problem is at the very same time these property values dropped, Detroit was going through the largest municipal bankruptcy in US history. And so they just, the, the, the city didn't have the wherewithal, the manpower, the woman power, the people power, whatever you wanna call it, right? To adjust the property prices to reflect these uh, drastically new uh, lower market value. So to make sure we are all on the same page, I wanna go over how a property tax bill is calculated. So we look at the assessed value or taxable value uh, minus qualifying exemptions. People in Detroit, uh, in Michigan, if, at least in Detroit, if you live under the poverty line, uh, you are not supposed to be paying taxes in the first place. There's also exemptions traditionally given to senior citizens and veterans times the property tax rate. And that's how you get your property tax liability. There had been, before I started my work, there had been lots of work done about Detroit's property tax rate, which is one of the highest in Michigan, and in fact, one of the highest in the United States. There had been also a lot of work done about assessed values and assessment inequity. But before uh, I started my work, everyone was talking about assessment and equity, and no one was talking about illegality. What do I mean by that? The Michigan state constitution is quite clear. No property can be assessed at more than 50% of its market value. This rule is not only in the state constitution, but it's in case law supporting legislation. There's really no question about it. And so um, what we did is we said, we did our first, my initial study that I did looking at this um, issue of the property tax foreclosure crisis is I looked at homes um, between 2009 and 2014 15, and I found that in each of these seven years, anywhere between 55 and 85% of properties were being assessed in violation of the Michigan State Constitution. And then I wanted to know, well, which homes are being overassessed? So we broke the data up into what we call five quintiles, right? Quintile one being the uh, lowest valued homes, quintile five being the highest valued homes. And we found that in quintile one and two, 95% or more of properties are being assessed in violation of the Michigan State Constitution. Whereas in quintile five, the highest valued homes, the number was about 18%. And we can talk about why that is in, in Q&A if you guys are uh, interested. 
So because of this overwhelming evidence of illegality, what lots of people uh, know is that Detroit gets taken over by an emergency manager, right? But what people don't know is that the state also took over Detroit's assessment division because of this overwhelming evidence of illegality. And Detroit only got control back from the state of its assessment division in 2017, once it completed a parcel by parcel reassessment of every property in Detroit. So we redid our, uh, what's called an assessment ratio study. We, we redid the study, um, Actually, my colleague at the University of Chicago redid this uh, particular study to figure out, did things get better? And the good news is that generally things got better, but for the lowest valued homes, as you can see here, things did not get better. The lowest valued homes are in red, and you can see that even after the 2017 reassessment, the lowest valued homes are still, the vast majority of them are still being overassessed. Okay, uh, and again, we can talk about why I think that is in the Q&A if people are interested in having more detail there. All right, so the, the, end, the, the story here is this. Higher priced homes in Detroit are being taxed significantly under the legal limit, where lower priced homes are being illegally taxed above the, the limit set by the Michigan state constitution. So this is something we've known for quite some time. I've been doing this work for uh, research for five years in Detroit, but let me tell you something, okay? No matter what uh, us scholars were doing, there was an expose in the Detroit news that really blew the top off of this whole thing. And they are able to say that between 2010 and 2016, the city of Detroit stole $600 million. Why is it that all those scholars had been showing this illegality, these inflated taxes? Why is it that this particular expose is what caused thousands of people to descend upon City Hall and close down City Hall? This particular expose is what angered Detroit to got homeowners activated. What did these reporters do that us scholars didn't do? Well, what they did is they created, along with this story, an act that allowed you to put in your individual address and see how much you as an individual were overcharged by the city. Brilliant. I, I'm, I'm learning from these journalists, right? So it's like, there's one thing to put your finger on a larger trend of illegality, but there is, it's another thing to show homeowners how they are individually impacted. This, the, the Detroit News individualized the problem and that's when people became activated. Brilliant. So then our next study, which I co-authored um, with my colleague, Chris Berry, you know, there's lots of reasons people go into foreclosure. Lots and lots of reasons people go into foreclosure. Poverty, divorce, health bills, you can go on and on. So the real challenge in this particular study was to hold all those other reasons constant so we can measure the one variable of interest, illegally inflated property tax assessments. We wanted to know the impact of this one variable of illegally inflated property tax assessments on foreclosure rates. And the most conservative estimates possible tell us that 10% of all tax foreclosures would not have happened but for these illegally inflated property taxes. Let me let that sink in. And then when we looked at, we looked at just those lowest valued homes where I showed you 95% or more were being overassessed. When you look at not all homes, but just those lowest valued homes, we're able to say one in four of those homes would not have gone into tax foreclosure, but for these illegally inflated property tax assessments. So what do we have in Detroit? Well, we have a situation where uh, the city of Detroit is illegally inflating property taxes, which lead to illegally inflated property tax bills that people cannot afford to pay. And so they are, the uh, Wayne County is foreclosing and confiscating title to, to homes at, at levels, at rates we have not seen since the Great Depression. But the final part of this uh, entire disaster is it was all for property taxes they were not supposed to be paying in the first place. 
because I started this presentation and I told you about exemptions. I said, if you live below the poverty line, you're not supposed to be paying taxes in Detroit. Well, guess what? 40% of Detroiters live below the poverty line, but the city of Detroit made it so difficult to uh, access this entitlement that many people were foreclosed on for property taxes they should not have been paying. And when I say they made it difficult for people to, I'm talking about they didn't do simple stuff like put it online, but then they did like intentionally crazy stuff like forcing you to apply in order to receive the application. You had to apply in order to apply. Uh, I can go on and it wasn't until the, the legal dream team, we had ACLU of Michigan, NAACP Legal Defense Fund and the deep pockets came from the law firm of Covington and Burley, Burling brought suit against the city of Detroit that they began to clean up their act and make the poverty tax ex ex exemption more accessible. All right, so this is what's going on in Detroit. In Detroit. But I need you to know this is Detroit is not alone. This is not just a problem of Detroit. It's a problem in Wayne County. So although I, I've lived in Detroit because I do ethnography and so I, I live not in downtown, but I live on the east side of Detroit in a community that's particularly hard hit by the property tax foreclosure crisis because I'm trying to understand the crisis from the perspective of those I live beside. So I live in Detroit at the moment and I'm talking to you from Detroit, but I'm actually a professor in Chicago. And so, I, you know, but I'm originally from LA, let me make that clear. So when I got to Chicago, I said, oh my God, the segregation blew my mind uh, in Chicago. But what's going on here in Wayne County puts whatever makes, you know, whatever segregation that's going on in Chicago look, look, look like child's play. Black and white people in Wayne County do not live together. Of the 43 municipalities in Wayne County, Three have a supermajority of black, meaning 70% or more, and 33 have a supermajority population that is white. This is horrible, but for the world, right? But it's great for me because I can ask a research question that says I can compare the majority black cities and say, are the majority black cities being subjected to these illegally inflated property tax assessments and foreclosure rate at the same rate as the majority white cities? Because in Wayne County, there is such a thing as a white city and a black city, unfortunately. And I found that as you can see at the left, the majority black cities foreclosure rates are through the roof and the majority white cities are not experiencing foreclosures at the same rate as the majority black cities. And I also found that in the majority white cities, 91% of them are doing the assessments, conducting the assessments according to the law, making sure that the properties on average, right, do not, the, the assessment does not exceed 50% of the property's market value. But every single one, one of the three majority black cities are uh, unconstitutionally assessing their homeowners. And so I want to stop here to really emphasize that this is a racial justice issue, right? This problem is racialized. This isn't another way to say that is this is a quintessential example of structural racism. Okay, and this is a issue of structural racism, not just because of this evidence in Wayne County, but there's national evidence that this is an issue of structural racism. All right, so um, one of uh, some of my colleagues, Carlos Avenacio Leon from uh, and Troop Howard, did a fantastic study. They got access to this national data set that is just phenomenon, ph phenomenal, and they uh, are able to tell us that throughout the country. Black and Hispanic homeowners pay on average 10 to 13% high a 10 to 13% higher tax rate than whites for the same bundle of goods. And that uh, turns out to be about 300 to 400 dollars annually more. And if you live in a community that has a higher percentage of blacks and Hispanics, then that 10 to 13% number goes way up. Now, Chris Berry, my colleague from University of Chicago, also did a national study, and he looks at he looks at all 50 states, and he's able to say that of all 50 states, Michigan is the second worst in terms of this issue of what we call regressivity, which basically means lower valued homes being taxed at a higher rate than higher valued homes. So for any, but let me make it plain, for any racial justice issue, 
Michigan is just behind Alabama and before and just ahead of Mississippi. You never want to be behind Alabama and just ahead of Mississippi on any racial justice issue. The situation in Michigan is severe. That's another way to say that. All right. So I want to conclude because I want to uh, leave time for Q&A. This is a really, you know, I'm telling you about all these problems and it, it, it can be shocking and depressing, but I never like to leave sh students shocked and depressed. I like to leave students with a sense of hope because there's always hope. And so the people in Detroit are not taking this lying down. There is a coalition called the Coalition for Property Tax Justice, which has a, uh, has a coalition of about a dozen grassroots organizations that have come together based on this data of, this, uh, of these unconstitutionally inflated property tax assessments to fight back. And the coalition has three primary goals. The first goal is to stop these unconstitutional tax assessments. The second goal is to stop the ongoing foreclosures because although last year in 2020, there was a moratorium on foreclosures because of the pandemic, this year, the treasurer announced they will continue to foreclose on people as if the pandemic is over um, uh, and, and as if there is not this overwhelming evidence of illegality. It really boggles the mind what's happening, but they have decided to reinstate the auction and they're going to continue to foreclose on people uh, in 2021. And so the coalition is working hard to make sure that doesn't happen, uh, at least uh, for owner occupied homes, right? Because a home is more than bricks and mortar. It's memories, it's legacy. It's, and so when you take somebody's home, you should be a thousand percent certain that everything was done according to the letter of the law before you take someone's home. The third and final goal of the coalition is compensation. Okay, because you can't just be taking people's home talking about some oops, I'm sorry. No, there's no oops, I'm sorry. There's compensation that's required. And so that's the third and final goal. So as you can see here in the, um, this is all, when we talk about what's happening, this is law and organizing uh, at its best. And so the first demand, the first demand is of Mayor Duggan. And the demand is that Mayor Duggan create a compensation fund, right, where uh, Detroiters who are, can, uh, are proven to have been overtaxed and or foreclosed on can receive some kind of compensation. And I can't stress how important that is because I need you all to understand that this is not the first instance of racialized dispossession in Detroit. I need you to understand that this is merely the latest chapter in a longer history of dispossession, right? It started with slavery, but we could start with racial, racial zoning, racially restrictive covenants, urban renewal, highway removal, predatory lending, redlining, block busting. I mean, I can, I can go all day if you let me. And so it, we will continue to have these racialized instances of dis dispossession unless some, it, the only way it can stop is this, if something is done. Not one of those instances of racialized dispossession that I just rattled off had a moment of reckoning with compensation. And that's why we continue to have more and more. And so compensation is about stopping, making sure that this is the last point in this longer history of, 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 of racialized dispossession. The next target is Eric Sabri. Like I told you, he somehow, you know, you know, to be honest, I just don't know how he sleeps at night. But they are in 2021 going to be kicking people out of their homes again this year in 2021 in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, and so we're calling, he is the one that has the power to stop that. So we're calling on Eric Sabri to use his power to stop not all foreclosures, but just those of owner occupied homes until we can make sure that the amounts people owed were not e illegally inflated. And the third and final target is Governor Whitmer because these, uh, these illegally inflated property tax assessments continue till this day. Mayor Duggan refuses to acknowledge all of the data. Uh, we recently had a press conference. The, um, there was an expose done by Bloomberg News showing that these illegally inflated property tax assessments continue. There's a study out by the University of Chicago showing that these illegally inflated assessments continue. Uh, the mayor and his administration refused to look at data and instead they attacked, made personal attacks against the professor who did the study. 
And so three other professors, economists, redid from scratch the study done by University of Chicago and also found that these overassessments continue. But despite this overwhelming evidence from various sources that overassessments continue in Detroit, Mayor Duggan is pretending like it's not happening um, because it's a, you know, he, this is a re-election year and his story is he's cleaned up the problem although the data says something different. So the coalition is calling on Governor Whitmer to do what the state did in 2017, which is to come in to Detroit and fix the problem. So I wanna leave you with this. Again, I just presented you an issue of racialized dispossession. Um, it's a really stressful, distressing story, but I wanna leave you with a sense of hope to know that there are fighters in Detroit who are fighting back and who are making progress. So with that, I will um, uh, stop here and uh, we can start the Q&A. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Professor, for being here today and sharing this with us. Uh, we're incredibly deeply thankful for the time and knowledge and your expertise as both a scholar and an activist um, in sharing this interconnectedness of both of racial justice, environmental justice, economic, and housing justice um, here in Detroit and, and nationally as well. Um, today, I also wanna thank my uh, fellow students for co-authorship of, of my acknowledgement of the violence and harm that comes from years of racialized injustice and abuses. And uh, we must acknowledge this through a lens of space and place as we connect predatory cities with dispossession of the original tenants of this land. Um, so I would like for us to acknowledge that here in Southeast, Southeastern Michigan, we live, work, and learn on the traditional homelands of the Anishinaabeg peoples, who are also known as the people of the three fires, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi, along with their neighbors, the Seneca, Delaware, Shawnee, and Wyandotte nations, lived on and stewarded the land now known as the Great Lakes for hundreds of years before settlers created the colonial state within which we now live. To this day, the University of Michigan benefits financially from the Anishinaabeg lands that were ceded to the federal government in the 1817 Treaty at the Foot of the Rapids. Since the forced removal of many indigenous people from their land and, and communities in the region, their historical ties to the land and to the, and to the origins of the university have become obscured and forgotten. We also acknowledge the violence and brutality inflicted on those who were stolen from their homelands and brought to North America as slaves. We've recognized this exploitation did not end with emancipation, and we stand in solidarity and complicity to eliminate white supremacy and threats to black life. Finally, we acknowledge that these words are not enough, but may they serve as a reminder that we must take actions to restore right relations with the Anishinaabe, first people of this land, and to address the systemic harms of slavery, discrimination, and many forms of racism that persist and create so much harm. Um, your concept of state graph professor is precisely the kind of intellectual work that helps us kind of connect so, so much of the harm today with the past and future and the harms in our own backyards, um, both, uh, both in our own backyards and across the region and across the world. Um, for everyone present today, I would like to share, I would like everyone to share any questions that they may have um, with the Q&A function. Um, and as we have um, some questions to roll in, uh, I can start us off. Uh, so your work is incredibly important in framing this issue of predatory cities as a predatory system rather than a set of predatory people. Um, in fact, um, as you know, I'm currently working with the U of M law students and some current members of the Detroit Board of Review to create a teaching module for those serving on the Board of Review and cities across the state of Michigan to examine their practices and understand the system as a whole so that they can better understand how the system came to be and who is at stake. Um, and too often from the Board of Review's perspective, residents of Detroit um, who, are risk, who are at risk of foreclosure um, are seen as uh, essentially deserving. Um, and the Board of Review cites this dominant narrative of blaming the poor for, for bad money management practices. Um, and so we see that the Board of Review is not essentially built to consider these illegal assessments, nor the structural racism, such as, as you mentioned, the racial zoning, mortgage redlining, predatory lending um, that is inherent in the system. And these teaching materials are really intended to reframe these issues as structural and not merely 
individual, um, just the same as how we understand the Board of Review members are not inherently evil, but they are serving within a system that is itself struggling um, and overstretched and poorly funded. Um, and so many of us seek to engage these practices and actors. Do you have any advice based on your experience for doing so? Yeah, so I think you make such an important point um, about, uh, so my advice has to be, do with narratives. Okay, so that's going to be my advice to everybody. What do I mean by that? When I did, when I was going through, because at this point, I've, uh, you know, through my qualitative work, I've interviewed almost every single person uh, who in charge of the, the, the process, minus the mayor, who wouldn't meet with me because of an ongoing litigation. Um, and I heard from every single leader the same story, meaning what uh, one the leader told me was Dave Shemansky said, he said, you know, I said, how can you explain one in three homes? Like, what do you think is going on? Well, he told me, Professor, when people, and he said this also in a public, it's in a, in a newspaper. He also said this in a, a public gathering. When people had a choice between buying a purse and paying their taxes, unfortunately, they chose to buy the purse. Vicky Kovari, who was the head of Department of Neighborhoods at the time, I said, what do you think is happening? And she told me, well, Professor, I think people are buying homes that they could not afford. I can go on and on. But the thing that connected each and every one of these explanations was the, the, what they thought was going on was a failure of personal responsibility. And this is a move that's often a narrative move that is often made, this is not limited to property tax foreclosure. This is the way we, you know, we understand poverty. It's about failures of personal responsibility. And that narrative is so destructive because what it does is it averts our gaze from what's really going on, which is this structural injustice over here. It's about the, the systemic justice of illegally inflated property tax assessments. That's, that, that's the bigger part of the story, but we can't see that if we're busy looking over here, looking for failures of personal responsibility. And what is so heartbreaking is I also, when I did, I do at this point over 150 interviews of people who have been subject to foreclosure, they are also internalizing these narratives of failure of personal responsibility. I lost mama's house. I lost granddaddy's house. Because when you um, go through property tax foreclosure, these are mostly paid off houses that people have inherited, people's legacies. And they're blaming themselves, beating themselves up for losing that particular house because they can't see this thing called illegally inflated property taxes, right? They, they didn't know about that. And so all they had was to blame themselves. And they're living under this cloud of this debilitating cloud of shame that prevents them from fighting back. And it's because this narrative of a failure to, of personal responsibility has prevailed. Until we started our work, this narrative of this systemic injustice was invisible. And so the work of scholars, the work of students interested in social justice, the work that needs to be done is a narrative work. It's a work of changing the narrative from the failure of personal responsibility, which is so easy to see, to doing the work of unearthing these structural injustices and pointing and, and sending people's gaze here. Because it's only through this, 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 this change of the narrative gaze that we can actually end up solving the problem. Because if I define the problem as a, as a failure of personal responsibility, well, then you got to get your morals together and stop buying the damn purses. That's the solution. But once I identify the problem as systemic, Oh no, now Detroit has to stop illegally inflating the property taxes. That's the solution. So our job is, is one of, especially academics, is one of changing narratives. And that just doesn't happen by publishing some paper. The academy is broken, right? What we all do as academics, it's, I'm part of a broken system, right? Is we, we publish a paper and then we move on to the next project. And why we do that? Because our systems of getting tenure and internal validation, revolve around the number of, of papers we publish. And you know all this work I'm doing, if it wasn't for this uh, fellowship I got from the Soros Foundation, it's not even counted in my institute. I still have the same amount of, uh, uh, of classes. I have to teach the same amount of uh, 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 
internal work, right? None of that got reduced for this thing that's like a full-time job, making sure that doing this work of changing the narrative, it's not acknowledged anywhere in the, you know, because our system is broken, right? We don't see ourselves in the academy as our job being to take an active role in making sure data informs these narrative and that takes work. You have to do more than publish a paper for that to happen. Right, but but that's not what we do in the academy. And again, it, it, it's just fundamentally broken. So let me stop there. That was an awesome answer and an awesome question. I wanna thank both Jess and Bernadette for that exchange. And since you mentioned data, I wanna just come in. I see three orders of questions in our chat and our Q&A queue. One is data focused. Two is uh, broader consequences of what you're describing and three is potential solutions focused okay so we have a couple questions in each category as far as i can tell we've got a couple of data questions a couple of consequences questions and a couple of solutions questions let's start with the data questions two of them <clears throat> one of them from kara asked early in the talk why are homes in the lower quintiles more likely to be overtaxed than homes in higher quintiles now i think some of your talk actually did answer some of that question as you built out your narrative. But I just want to be sure, Kara, that you feel like that question got answered and <clears throat> that we open up a mic if you need to talk about it. I haven't answered that one yet. So let me let me answer that. And then you can get, give me the questions one by one just because I forget. Right on. It's a very important question. So let me explain to you what's happening. The problem is a problem of, av so let me, before I get to the averages, um, first is resources. Right, I'm empowered. In, in, I own a had to own home here. I own a, my home in Chicago. Anytime the property, I I protest them every single time, right? And when you protest, but guess what? A lot of poor people or people in lower valued homes do not have access to lawyers or their uh, resources or education to protest the taxes. So that's that's the number one problem is uh, protesting the taxes. And it's not just individuals. There's a lot of models. Um, so for instance, in Chicago every year in the high valued neighborhoods, you get all these lawyers um, papering you saying, we'll appeal your taxes for meaning they, and they get, it's called a contingency model. They get a percentage of what they win. And so of course, for me, it's a win-win. Even as a lawyer, I like dealing with these people because I, I ain't got no time, right? I don't have time for all of this. So they do it and I give them 20% of what they saved. But guess what? They're not papering the neighborhoods of lower valued homes, which are in fact being more overassessed, but the, the margins are smaller. And so there's a, a failure, a market failure as well in terms of why these lower valued homes are not being appealed. So that's the first problem is appeals. Lower valued homes are less likely to, to get appealed than higher valued homes. But then there's another problem of why the lower valued homes are assessed overassessed at a systematic rate in the first place. And that's a problem of averages because the way that uh, in Michigan that they are legally required to do assessments is based on averages of something called ECFs, economic condition factors. They group a neighborhood and the groups are supposed to be contiguous. Uh, and then they take the average for that small neighborhood and that's what they base the assessment on. By definition, an average means the higher valued home is gonna be underassessed and the lower valued home is gonna be overassessed. By definition, the use of averages causes regressivity, causes the lower valued homes to be taxed at a higher rate than the higher valued home. So it's a problem of averages, which is, all, which is a problem at the state level of the law and how they calculate assessments. It doesn't have to be, there's so, at this point, we have so many models and there's so much out there that we don't have to be using this 1950s system of averages anymore, right? We, we data analysis has progressed and, so, and, and Michigan is somehow still back in the 1950s using these uh, averages. So that's the a full answer to your question as to why they're still overassessed. And then, so it's a problem of averages and a problem of who actually protests the taxes. Okay, there was a second data question, Rebecca. Yes, second data question. Um, someone was asking, can you look at the data over time and see if or how the majority white cities bought out the foreclosures from the majority black cities? Well, so it's not bought out. I'm, so, so the point is the, what, how these properties are sold or at auction. 
there's two auctions. There's an August auction where the property is sold for the amount of taxes and fees owed. Anything that doesn't sell in the first August auction goes to the second September auction and the starting bid is $500. So your question you're really asking me is who's buying these homes? Who's buying these tax foreclosed homes? That's what you're asking me. And that's a, oh, honey, that is a story. And I tell that story, I'm working on a book right now. I tell that story in the book, but it, I mean, it, it blow, it's, it's, it's not only people here in Michigan, white and black, it is people all over the nation, all over the world buying these homes in Detroit. Uh, and some investors are ethical, some are unethical. I mean, there's just so much there, but the point is the story of who is buying these homes from the auction is, you know, it's a lot of different people of a lot of different races. Uh, so yeah, so that's the story there. That's great. We, um, I'm going to move to a consequences question real quick. And this one's coming out from a student in Damani's seminar on governance and care. Um, I, I should take this opportunity to point out um, my wild enthusiasm for your frontal critique of the academic system and my gratitude to you for making it and making it and making it. Damani's teaching, including his course on the futures, uh, filming the futures of Detroit, uh, as well as his governance and care seminar, and my teaching in this very class we're all in today, is a conscious set of practices designed to try to break down some of those trends you talk about, some of those norms you talk about. But I tell you what, it's a lot of work. So I want to thank, I just want to take this brief moment to thank both of you for being in that with me over time and today right now. This question coming from Ember, also a foot soldier in that struggle, who's a PhD student at CES taking Damani's seminar, is about whether in the paper, you talk about the city of Detroit as a, quote, violated violator, which itself is a very interesting formulation, worthy of sympathy. I wonder if you could speak more about the context leading to the vulnerability of the city itself, which then, as you say, intensifies the vulnerability of its residents. Now, I just want to piggyback on that question, which is such a great one. Um, because when you talked about the cities that you could have discussed today, right, at the very front end of your talk, you mentioned New Orleans which of course also comes to mind as being in that rich category of um, both violated and violator um, and, and many others. Chicago is one perhaps. Um, so I, I think there's a really, this, this is probably a question that's very much about Detroit, but maybe also has resonance um, beyond, beyond Detroit in some ways. And I think it's, it's just a really, really great question. What do you, what do you yeah, have to so say? We have to be really careful Right. This is basically a, a mirror. It's going to be very close to my narrative uh, answer I just gave. Right. Because we have to be very careful what people want to say when they look at this. They want to say, oh, it's Detroit. It's corruption in Detroit. That's what people always want to chalk very nuanced, complicated problems. They want to put it under this very uh, an, uh, amorphous umbrella of corruption. No, that's not the story. Right. And we also have to be careful because it's like, you know, again, they, these, uh, you know, this black run city full of incompetent people, it can also get pretty racist, right? The, uh, uh, w when they talk about what's going on in Detroit. And so this is another question again of, of gaze. So we, we have to, Detroit didn't get into this mess by itself. That's, that's my, gonna be my end point. And you have to look at how Detroit got here. Right. You have to look at the historic tension between the majority black city and the majority white county. And because that, that's a big question in terms of who's financially benefiting. But let me come back to that because that's where I want to uh, spend most time. But, you know, the um, many of you know, the state has reduced, drastically reduced funding to the state of Michigan has drastically reduced funding to its cities. Um, through the EVIP program, that was the main way of, 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 of funding. They, they, they drastically reduced uh, that funding. At the same time as the federal government has drastically reduced funding to local governments. The CDBG block grant is one of the main vehicles for funding local governments. And, uh, you know, in real dollars, cities are getting drastically less than they did when it started being cut back in Ray Reagan days, right? Uh, so they're, they're getting less today than they did 20 years ago. So we have to understand the role of the state, understand the role of the federal government. But the real rub is, is this county, county city rub. So 
I always say when you have a problem in your life, you have got to follow the money. Okay. And when you follow the money, you're going to really figure out what's up, what's down, what's all around. <laughs> and when you follow the money in, in, in this particular story, the only entity making a profit, financially benefiting from delinquency and foreclosure in Detroit is Wayne County. It's a complicated process, but essentially what happens is when you fail to pay your taxes in Detroit, after one year of delinquency, the county uh, takes over that debt and they give the city the, the money for the failed taxes just so the city can have a smooth budget, uh, et cetera. And then the county takes over the right to collect the taxes at 18% interest for delinquency, number one. And they're supposed to put all that money into something called the delinquent tax revolving fund. But what we found is lots of people know that Detroit went through bankruptcy and, and had an emergency manager. But what many people don't know is that Wayne County at the very same time was in a financial emergency. And Wayne County averts a emergency manager and bankruptcy by using the funds in the delinquent tax revolving fund. Do you understand what I'm telling you? They saved themselves through delinquency and foreclosure in Detroit. So you think it would have been a one-time thing, but they still, the county budget still relies on the delinquent tax revolving fund till this day. Uh, uh, Warren Evans, the county executive, has gone on record at NPR saying that this is blood money and he hopes that they can stop using it sometime soon. <laughs> I'm like, you know, it, it's funny when someone says that and they have the power to stop and they talk about hopes when it's like they have the power to stop it. Well, why don't you stop using it then? Don't get me started. Anyway, so this is this is it. When you talk about, um, uh, you know, what's going on, you have to look beyond Detroit. And that's the violated violator. Yes, Detroit is illegally inflating these property taxes, but there are also these other actors at play. And we have got to resist this societal, um, I, a pressure to tell simplified, uh, uh, context-less stories. And we've got to push back and tell these stories that have context, that have nuance, that are complicated, because guess what? The truth is complicated. The truth is not a soundbite. I'll stop there. Thank you so much for that. I feel like you, that that's, that's very powerful. Um, we have another question um, about the Michigan Department of Treasury. Um, so uh, the asker is, is wondering if another approach would be to ask the Michigan Department of Treasury to implement reforms, uh, parentheses, to add to the list of officials who could help um, because the Michigan Home Property Tax Refund asks taxpayers to report taxable value of their home, their property paid and knows their income they could flag and automatically refund illegally collected property taxes. And while you're getting your eyes on that, Bernadette, it's a long and a complex question. You can see it betrays some real thought and knowledge of our Michigan institutions here and some creative thinking about this is we're moving now into the solutions question, right? Um, what what would you say to that possibility? And um, and and yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I'll end this because I have a to stop at one for this plumber who's coming by telling you about the lawsuits. All right. And um, so I told you part of one of the first lawsuit, which was against the city of Detroit for this obstructive administration of the poverty tax exemption. The other way we tried to address this is there was also in that same lawsuit a case against Wayne County. And that was the basis of that case was a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Um, uh, a violation of the Fair Housing Act for this racialized property tax assessments that I've just described to you in the presentation. Can I tell you that till this very day, that case has not been heard on the merits. Although we have this unequivocal evidence, everybody's ready to come as an expert. I mean, it has, we have never had our day in court. Why? Because of procedural issues. And this is so important for law students to hear. Law students, we're, we teach our students, oh, there's an illegality, take, to, take it to court and the courts will fix illegality. No, sometimes the law, the courts cannot fix illegality. So what happens? Take the court, Judge Colombo 
says, oh, you know, improper venue. You should have taken this not to the, 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 the uh, Wayne County Court, to the uh, uh, state courts, but to the Michigan Tax Tribunal. It goes up on appeal. The appeal court agrees with Judge Colombo, and then the Michigan Supreme Court denies cert. Why is this improper venue, this procedural de decision, why does it kill the case? It kills the case for three reasons. Number one, the Michigan in tax tribunal, the statute of limitations is essentially 15 days, right? Whereas the Fair Housing Act, it's two years for these kinds of claims. I can explain why. Second is it's the Michigan Tax Tribunal, it doesn't even, the tribunal doesn't even have lawyers on it. Some are real estate agents, appraisers, et cetera. So it's not a court and it doesn't have injunctive power. And so that's what we're asking is for the for court to force Detroit to stop this. That's an injunction. And this particular court doesn't have injunctive power. And the third and final reason why this procedural improper venue ruling kills the case is because again, because the Michigan Tax Tribunal is not a court, it doesn't have ability to do class action. And so you have to do the case one by one by one, even though I told you 55 to 85% of properties are being over assessed, you have to go one by one by one and you can't do a class action. So with this procedural decision, this case never gets heard on its merits. And so a, a big way, again, that you would think of, of, of correcting this would be through the courts, since it's such a clear instance of illegality. And sometimes illegality is not clear. And it's only because Michigan has a ratio. It can't be more than 50% of a market value. We know we can estimate market value, right? And so it's a calculation. And so it, it's, it's very clear. Unlike in other instances, legality is not as clear, um, but we, we still were never able to hear this particular uh, case on the merits. So the point is any other solution, the treasury, et cetera, is not gonna move unless they, are, they have a political or legal mandate to move. And so we haven't been able to get the legal mandate. And so now the coalition is really working politically, as you can see, calling on Governor Whitmer to act, uh, et cetera, to come to the solution. Bernadette, so, with your characteristic breathtaking efficiency, you have basically answered two questions in one. Jordan James Larson had lodged a question about wanting to know more about whether there were any successful legal precedents of municipalities and court cases that were creating compensation mechanisms, which is, of course, not entirely answered. But these are the kinds of questions we'll take forward in the work that you're supporting by law students and by environmental justice students and anthropology and African studies students on our campus, building out teaching and training materials, I know this is, you know, today is the beginning of a conversation, not the end of it. Um, <clears throat> so I do want to respect your time and, and close us out on time here with having at least read through all of the excellent questions that we received in our Q&A function and our chat. And, you know, really just recognize the, the caliber of the exercise today, of the exchanges today. I feel like I've really gotten somewhere in my own knowledge. Jess, I want to thank you. Do you have any last words you'd like to say or, or you, Bernadette or Damani, as we close out this hour? I just want to say a big thank you to you, Rebecca, for inviting me, Damani, for that amazing introduction, and Jess for that wonderful engagement. I love how you gave the context, and so important, Jess, to start with the Native peoples, right? When you talk about dispossession, so important to mention the first dispossession, so uh, infinite thanks for that. Thank you, everyone. I have to go deal with this plumber. Lord, 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 pray for me. <laughs> Bernadette, thank we you. are all praying for you. And thank you for sharing your time with us today. We'll be back at you with more energy soon on all of these issues. Take good care. Bye, everybody. See you so next much. week, everybody, for another lunchtime lecture with Jalon White Newsom. Get ready. Can't wait to see you.